Good evening, and welcome to the Marion Minor Cook Athenaeum. My name is Michael Grouske, and I am one of this year's Ath Fellows. In a 1961 speech before the American Newspaper Association, President John F. Kennedy said that without debate, without criticism, no administration, no country can succeed, and no republic can survive. This presidential election season provides an excellent example of the influence of the press in the American political process. Not just as a means of conveying information, but also in shaping public perceptions of the candidates for better and for worse. Tonight's speakers, Brandi Hoffine and Michael Shear, are two CMC alums who have built their careers upon the intersection of politics and journalism in Washington, D.C. Ms. Hoffine graduated from CMC in 2006 and has worked as a spokesperson for the U.S. Treasury, Tim Kaine's communications director, and for the DNC. Since 2014, she has been the assistant press secretary and spokesperson for the White House, where she handles a range of domestic and international policy issues. Michael Shear graduated from CMC in 1990 and is currently the White House correspondent for the New York Times Washington Bureau. Prior to joining the Times, Mr. Shear was a reporter for the Washington Post, and among other things, he has covered several previous elections and the first two years of Obama's presidency. In addition to his degree from CMC, Mr. Shear is a graduate of Harvard's John F. Kennedy School of Government. Tonight's discussion will be moderated by Professor Zach Corser, who is himself a graduate of CMC's class of 1999 and is now serving as a visiting assistant professor of government and research director for the Dreyer Roundtable. As always, audio and visual recording is prohibited. Please join me in welcoming Brandi Hoffine and Michael Shear to the Athenaeum. Do you have a place that you want to yeah, sit? Yeah, where do you? You can be in the middle. <laughs> well, you were at the good head table. <laughs> they, they said that's the permanent one, and I got the extra one. The, they all look very great, lovely, Mike. Students, why are you dissing so your table? No, I'm not dissing your table. Well, what a pleasure for three alumni of Claremont McKenna to be up here talking about politics at go. the Athenaeum. That's pretty good. Nice. So, how did, how did we meet each other? Well, I, I want to give you guys a little bit of background to know what came, why we came uh, up with this idea. So. Part of the Dry Around Table's activities are to encourage students to consider public careers uh, in public service. And together with the Career Services Department, we put together our first DC networking trip uh, during spring break of this year. And uh, Mike and Brandy agreed to host us and talk about what it's like to work in the White House, talk about their careers in journalism. Uh, Brandy was very nice to give us the Roosevelt Room in the West Wing which uh, was very exciting, something I'd only seen recreations of on television. And <laughs> one of our students got to sit in the chair that President Obama gets to sit in. I mean, it was grade A access to the West Wing. We even had those little things that say V on it, you know, when you come to visit the West Wing. <laughs> and it was a great conversation, um, one that our students loved. In fact, I think it was a highlight of our trip. And I wanted to see if we could bring that same conversation here to CMC's living room, the Athenaeum. And Fortunately, they're both able to take time out of their very busy schedules to come here. So. There's nothing going on. Oh, no, yeah. <laughs> Not much going on, nothing to talk about, no. really. Um, so today, uh, I thought it might be a good place to start to talk about your career paths, because I know a lot of our students are very interested in public service, working in politics, but it's hard to see sometimes how do you get from Gov20 to the White House. <laughs> so. Maybe yeah. starting with you, Mike, you could give us a little insight into your career path and sort of how you got from CMC to the New York Times. Sure. Um, so thank you. It's great to be here. Um, Brandy and I have like mapped out our conversation. We talked, had coffee the other day and talked about what we would say. So As all good CMCers we're, do, we prepared. We're, we're, we're ready. <laughs> um, the main thing, you know, there, it, when we were talking ahead, you were saying, you know, what do you need to be a journalist in Washington, D.C. covering politics? What do you need to have done mm. and what's your path? Really, all you need is to be able to quote Jack Pitney. Oh. So I had like a total advantage on everybody else <laughs> because I like knew Jack from, from being here. Um, Did you take your copy of Strunk and White with you? Absolutely. I mean, it's like all torn up. And, um, so I, I graduated here. I always knew I wanted to be a journalist I, from the time I was in high school. So it was, I, was very, I was one of your typical, di very directed mm -hmm. CMC students, did internships and all of that. Um, in 1990, when I graduated, the economy sucked. It was terrible. I couldn't get a job anywhere. And so I decided to go to graduate school, which is always a good thing. Um, and, you know, basically started in journalism 
at the real bottom level, I was a community reporter in Tampa, Florida for a little while before getting to the Washington Post. And I got to the Washington Post as a, as a very, very junior level intern, essentially, and covered everything from school boards to city councils to everything else, all the way up to uh, state politics, where I actually first met Brandy. We, I covered the state house in Virginia, uh, which meant eventually covering Tim Kaine, uh, where, who Brandy worked for, I covered his governor's race in 2005, covered him. I didn't actually cover him as mayor, though I knew him a little bit in Virginia yeah. as mayor. And then, uh, and then his Senate race and all of that. Um, and then in 2000 and s end of 2006, early 2007, I made the jump to national politics and I covered the 08 cycle for the Washington Post. Um, I was assigned to Republican candidates, uh, so that was Rudy Giuliani and <laughs> and John McCain and Mitt Romney the first time and Fred Thompson for about four minutes. <laughs> and, uh, and then McCain, when he won the nomination, I, I covered him fully every day from the time he got the nomination until he lost. And then when he lost and Barack Obama won, I, I started on the White House beat. Um, I was on the White House beat for um, two years at the Washington Post and then shifted over to the New York Times and, and ran their political blog uh, for uh, about a year and a half covering the re-election campaign. So it was still a sort of a White House kind of job, it's a White House center job. Uh, and then after the president won re-election, I started back formally on the White House beat and have, um, and have uh, done that ever since and will likely, uh, the plan is cover whoever um, comes in next. So that was my path and I, I um, you know, we can talk about that stuff. Yeah, we'll take some questions. I'm sure students probably have more questions for you yeah. about like what it's like today, because we'll talk in our discussion about how much media has changed since 1990, maybe even since 2000, maybe yeah. even since 2012. Right, exactly. <laughs> 1990, they didn't even have the internet. Yeah. So I know that's kind of <laughs> hard to imagine. Yeah. So and even Brandy doesn't remember the, yeah, you know, right, right, about right. the internet. So, so Brandy, can you give us a little background on how you ended up working at the White House? Sure, so um, like Mike, I was a very focused CMC student too. I came in to CMC knowing two things. One, I wanted to take Professor Pitney's Gov 20 class. And two- There's a common thread running through uh, here, isn't there? And two, I was gonna do the Washington DC program. And those two things were gonna support this like awesome DC career that I was gonna have. Um, Professor Pitney was on sabbatical when I started at CMC, so I couldn't take his <laughs> Gov 20 class. Uh, but I did circle back to the American presidency and Congress and the politics of journalism. So I got my Pitney, uh, my Pitney uh, class schedule filled eventually. Um, and then the Washington DC program. So I came in sort of knowing that I hoped my career path would take me to DC. Uh, I did the DC program, I took lots of Gov classes, I majored in government and history. Uh, but then, uh, and I don't know how many of you are seniors, but fall of senior year happened and I was like, oh boy, I need a job. And uh, it's really hard to get a job in politics in November of your senior year of college. But I really did want a job and I was very anxious about uh, what the future would bring. So fortunately, CMC did this great uh, on-campus recruiting for consulting firms. So I sort of, not really knowing anything about economics or business or uh, anything else, threw my hat in the ring and somehow managed to get hired at Deloitte Consulting, which I did for, um, I think, 14 months which got us all the way to fall of 2007. And if you were, I lived in DC while I was working for Deloitte. If you were living in DC in fall of 2007, whether you were a journalist or in, in politics on my side of the fence, it was just this incredibly exciting time. Uh, and I just felt this pull that I didn't, I was in the wrong thing and I didn't really wanna sit on the sidelines of this historic election, I wanted to be involved. So I uh, cold dropped my resume uh, for a DNC oppo research job, because again, Professor Pitney made oppo sound really cool. Um, and somehow I managed to get hired at the DNC and that sort of put me on this trajectory that ultimately led to the White House. Um, I served as the Deputy National Press Secretary at the DNC. That was where I had the good fortune and the lovely pleasure of spending a lot of time with then Governor of Virginia, Tim Kaine, who was also serving as DNC Chair. Uh, we got to know each other pretty well and when he ran for Senate in 2011, he asked if I would move to Richmond and um, run his communications. So I packed up my bags and I moved to Richmond and. Uh, 19 months later, we elected him to the Senate, uh, and that was great. Uh, but after that, it was sort of, again, another one of these kind of inflection points where uh, it was 2012, and I knew I really wanted to work for Barack Obama directly before his historic presidency was over. So uh, 
an opportunity at the Treasury Department presented itself. What I really wanted to do was go work at the White House, but yeah. after banging my head against a brick wall trying to get into the building, uh, that I realized, I thought, I was like, okay, this is just is not gonna happen, I should just move on, not very many people get to work at the White House, it's just not gonna work out for me. So I took a job at the Treasury Department, um, and for about two years I did economic press for the Treasury Department, and lo and behold, a job at the White House opened up covering the economic press portfolio. And had I not taken this treasury job, I don't think that particular door would have been open to me. So I hope what one thing people will take away from both Mike and I's career paths is, um, you know, a diversity of experiences is a really good thing. And you never know exactly which door is going to quite get you where you want to go. And so you kind of just have to take the circuitous route that you're on and see where it takes you in the end. Um, but for me, it fortunately, uh, finally a door opened into the White House, which I'd been trying to get into since I moved to DC. And uh, for the last two years, I've had the good fortune of handling um, economic and legal press for the president. So, Hendrik? In, in turn, th by the way, that's something that came up again and again at our conversations around DC was the circuitous path so many people followed, you know. Our students, of course, are aiming straight ahead. Right. They're very focused. As, as, were, as were we, I think, yeah. but. Right. No, that's true. <clears throat> but, you know, being open to opportunities is, I think, a really important mindset for everyone who's working in politics or in DC. And it's a small town. It's a it's an odd, mm -hmm. it's, um, you know, you find people recycle yep. and 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 move in and out of government, in and out of agencies, and the people that you thought you knew he over here two years later or somewhere else, and suddenly are in a position to hire you or to, um, in in my case uh, as a reporter, you often find yourself, um, you know, coming back to people. I mean, uh, you know. Uh, Jen Palmieri, who was a longtime Clinton hand, then came to Obama and was communications director for Obama. She and I got to know each other very well. Now she's Hillary's communications director. I mean, you know, the, the people move about, and you sort of find in Washington that it's it becomes a very small place, and that can that can be helpful uh, in your career as well because you'll you'll find avenues that open up because of that. So, um, talking about how media has changed. I think this was a, a topic that came up during our conversation in the Roosevelt Room, and it's something that uh, we all deal with as, you know, whether you're a political scientist trying to watch media events unfold and understand them, yep. to try to understand the media's effect on campaigns, on public opinion, uh, and then trying to square in how this is such a dynamic process that constantly is changing that's driven largely by innovations in, in digital media. So I'm really curious, and, and Brandy, I'll start with you, I mean, when you look at the tools that you have to communicate with the public, you think about, for example, whitehouse.gov, or the, you know, uh, Twitter, or Facebook, and you think about the opportunities that, that gives, this gives you to, to communicate directly with the public, and not have to call Mike. <laughs> I love calling Mike. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, has, has this really changed the way in which presidents communicate with the public? Do you think you have more control over your message and over what the public can hear thanks to these new tools? Yeah, um, look, I think that's the central question that Mike's bosses and um, our, you know, our organization, everyone's wrestling with to try to figure out how to navigate this sort of ever-changing media landscape. I think the most sort of, to your point about how it's changed even since 2012, I think one of the more telling statistics I've heard is when the president was reelected in 2012, there were fewer than a billion smartphones in the world and now one billion people use a smartphone to check Facebook every day, just four years later. And so thinking about, you know, the central question when we approach it is, <clears throat> how can we communicate the president's proactive policy agenda? Uh, and how can we actually get that message into people's homes in whatever way they're receiving their news? I think we have a lot less control for a lot of reasons over the message than, um, you know, even we did a year ago, uh, hmm. both because there's a lot of distractions and there's a lot of noise out there. So even if you wake up in the morning with a message of the day, that doesn't mean that that's what Mike is gonna be thinking about at 9 a.m. It might be something very different than that. So I think mm -hmm. the sort of overall changing landscape of media means less control. But it does mean that there are ways to get the president's voice particularly out there, tools that we can use that we didn't have before. Facebook, Twitter, Snapchat, the president has a, you know, the White House has a Snapchat channel. Mm -hmm. Um, I'm not on Snapchat. No, I'm so old because I said Facebook. I know, right? It, it's true, though. It's yeah. like we—it's hard to keep up with even uh, yesterday's technology, which is now something very different today. 
Uh, so we work very hard to think about how to use all those tools at our disposal. And we know that um, news outlets work very hard too. So the New York Times doesn't just do print stories, they do digital, they have a very active Twitter and Facebook profile. And so we know that they're gonna be using all those channels and we should use them too. So I do think that the technology has sort of changed the number of tools we have to communicate. But as I sort of thought about this, you know, I think presidents have always used whatever bully pulpit, whether it's, you know, sort of the blue Twitter bird or like the actual bully pulpit to get their message out. And, you know, I mean, that dates back to the earliest days of our union. The president, I don't know this quote because I'm such a student of Lincoln. I know this quote because my boss loves Lincoln. The president often said, quotes Lincoln who said, um, you know, with public uh, sentiment, nothing can fail. Without it, nothing can succeed. And so I think, you know, even from the earliest days of our union, presidents understood that um, being able to effectively communicate your agenda to the public was essential. And so you can sort of trace that through history, whether it's FDR and fireside chats, um, the advent mm -hmm. of the way the president used the bull presidents used the bully pulpit when nightly news was the main way that Americans received their news every day to today, where the president, you know, does a long form interview with the New York Times on climate change, which he did a month ago but also you know, has a very active Twitter and Facebook presence too. So I think it's not an either or, it's a both and. It's interesting you brought up FDR because of course he always refused to debate as well uh, because he preferred the control of the fireside right. chat. So Mike, from your perspective, as someone who's been covering the White House for some time, have you seen a change in the way in which you're able to access or, or understand what's going on in the White House because of these digital tools? So I, I, I yes, um, I think Brandy and I have had this back and forth many times. Um, <laughs> um, I, I, I take her point, and I think she's right that um, presidents have always had found ways to get their message out to the public. I, I, and I think, and I think it, it is certainly true that the president still, even today, the president and people like Brandy who represent the president and they're trying to get his message out, they still do. Uh, frequently interact with the media, and they still do frequently um, engage uh, with us on a substantive level. The climate change interview is a good example, but every day there are interviews that we do with that with Brandy or other people in the administration, all the way up, in, including the president, on a whole raft of topics. And so there is, um, you know, there's that still exists. I, the thing that concerns me, and the thing that I think this president and people like Brandy have been really good at doing is finding ways uh, to get around the critical filter of reporters who cover him every day um, and who are substantive, uh, substantively knowledgeable about the stuff that, that, that is the bulk of the president's agenda. And what, what the digital tools have allowed is, is that there are new ways that the president can find to take that message, remove the filter, remove the, the reporters who are asking tough questions, and simply go around us. And I, I'll give you one example that Brandy hates, but I'm gonna give, I'm gonna give it anyway. Um, Here we go again. I know, <laughs> there you go. Was, was that Mondale? No. <laughs> that was Reagan. Reagan, yeah. here we go, here you go again. Um, uh, so I, when I, this is just sort of a, an interesting kind of example. We went to Africa with the president in 2013, I was on the trip with him. One of the places we stopped was Senegal. And the president and the first family took a, some time out to go to uh, what they call the, the door, of, door no of no return, which is a, it's sort of a dungeon where Africans uh, were taken, held in this kind of underground dungeon and then ultimately put on boats to be sailed off to America to, to be sold as slaves. And so it was a, it's now been turned into a kind of museum and people can, you could, if you went to Senegal, you could go and, and see it. Um, and you know, the press corps, the, the, the people that were traveling with the president were right behind and as we, enter, as we went to enter the, the dungeon to follow him along, they, the press folks blocked us and said, no, 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 the, there's no press today. There's no press for this event. Um, the president and the, and the first family want to have a private family moment. And which are few and far between. In which the, are not, which, which, are which, the, in which the gig that he, uh, Brandy always points out, there, on a trip like this especially, there's lots of public events and lots of things that we did have access to. Um, Jay Carney, who was the press secretary at the time, and I fought, said some things 
to each <laughs> other. Um, and that are not becoming of the decorum of the Athenaeum. That's right. right. There were some <laughs> things like that said. Um, and we yelled it back and forth, and, uh, and Jay won, which happens. Uh, <laughs> Mike wins a lot, though. I, I don't win that many. Anyway, so he won. And so we did not, um, we did not cover that. He, was, he and the first family were down there for about an hour, maybe a little bit less. And then they, he emerged, and, and um, we went on with the rest of our trip. Um, the the frustrate the really frustrating point about and, and I you know we I will not belabor it but the really frustrating moment came the next morning when the White House published a seven minute video of the president and the first family in the dungeon that was taken by the White House videographer um, and to me it's a good example it's not the most weighty example, right? Like, I mean, the, 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 the fate of the world isn't going to rise or fall on whether or not the press has access to a family thing down in the, but to me, what it, what it represented was a question of control and access. And the, what the president really wanted was not a private family moment. What the pres president really wanted, she disagreed, maybe <laughs> they did also. It was a silent protest. It, okay. Yeah. Um, but what they really wanted was control over how that moment was presented to the American public. And with Facebook, they had it, right? I mean, if you th imagine a, a world where they don't have a 20 million follower Facebook page and a mm -hmm. however many millions are on the home page of the, of the White House and Twitter and everything else, it ha without that, they have no way to get that, that moment out unless they go through us. I mean, us. TV or newspaper, video, websites, whatever. But because they had Facebook, they didn't have to have us down there, and yet they could still get that out there in the way they wanted to get it out. So again, I don't want to overstate it, and Brandy and I have talked about this. It's not, uh, you know, and, and it's a kind of a nuanced moment, but um, that, that essential conflict between the press and the White House over access and control plays itself out again and again and again, and sometimes to the benefit of the press and sometimes to the benefit of the White House, and I think increasingly that's the fight that we're going to continue to have, and we can talk about uh, Hillary and Trump at some point, and, and I think those of us in the press have huge concerns um, based on the way that the two campaigns have run their operations to date, um, that what, whatever concerns I might have about the Obama administration are going to seem, uh, seem minimal compared to what the next administration might do. The, uh, Zach has heard both of these stories before, so I won't, <laughs> add, I won't add my analog yet. <laughs> I'll save it for another. I think there'll be an opportunity. The only thing I will say is everyone in this room should feel very, very good that Mike is not satisfied with the access that he's getting. Because the day that Mike says, yeah, I think the Obama administration is really transparent. I feel like I'm getting full access and I'm really well taken care of is one of the days where a central pillar of our democracy starts to crumble. So every day, Mike is going to be in our face saying, gee, I really wish I could be in the Oval Office with the President today, or gee, I really wish we could. Wait, is that? If possible? you just ask, you oh, never I, ask. I, <laughs> I knew I was forgetting something. So everyone should just feel really, really, really good that Mike is sitting next to me telling this story from years ago that he has yet to let go of. Um, <laughs> because, because it shows what a dedicated professional he is to making sure that he is getting the kind of serious access that you know, we will always work to get the New York Times. Well, you, you raised an interesting point about Jay Carney, and I think it's a question about how you do your job, Brandy in particular. You know, we see the public face of the president, and the president, you know, the most powerful person in, in the world, really. Um, but how much does the president rely on, particularly on his communication staff, to control the message? I mean, Jay was, was the, the gatekeeper on this question. Um, I'm kind of curious, you know, presidents are very busy, they, you know, they're wor worrying about policy, they're also probably worrying about how to communicate. How much control does the staff have, how much influence does the staff have over who can access the president and what the president can say, his message on a day-to-day -day basis? Yeah I, think that, yeah, I think that's a really good question. And um, I mean, I guess I would say a, a couple things. You know, first of all, and I think Mike will agree with me on this, when the president really wants to say something, the president finds a way to say whatever he has to say. Um, and a lighthearted example of this <laughs> is that a while ago, Mike wrote a very good story about the president being a night owl, because he is. And he wrote all about his late night habits and what he likes to do and what room he sits in and beautifully described the room that the president sits in and beautifully described his evening habits. And I read it and learned actually a lot about how the president spends his time that I didn't know. So it was a great piece. Thank you. 
Mike wrote that the president eats seven almonds every <laughs> night. <laughs> this apparently really got under the president's skin. <laughs> so at the next possible opportunity, which I think was an interview with Savannah, Savannah Guthrie yeah, yeah, and NBC, the president personally fact-checked Mike and said, <laughs> it's really not seven almonds every night. I'm not that crazy. So Mike has the uh, distinct honor of being guess, personally fact-checked by the president of the United States. It was actually a really lovely story, but that's my lighthearted way of saying both on serious matters and on things that just get under his skin. Uh, when the president wants to say something, he generally finds a way to say it. Uh, that being said, the president obviously has superhuman constraints on his time every day. Um, and so I think one thing, you know, there's a natural element of the job that is sort of trying to prioritize and um, make sure we're being smart and strategic and equitable with how we spend the president's time. So in that sense, there is an element of that. I mean, I think the other thing that I would say is that that's why there's people like me. So Mike and I, Mike can find me. I don't know how many of you have had the good fortune of touring the West Wing, but um, I sit in a room that's the size half, of the stage, half the size maybe, of the stage the with eight people <laughs> that backs right up to where the reporters work and Mike can come any time of day and stand over my shoulder and ask me any question he would like. <laughs> and I so, do. And he does. Um, and I love it because Mike is actually wonderful and lovely to talk to and usually has smart questions that make me think and you know, make me um, you know, have to run to our policy experts and ask a bunch of questions before I get back to him. Um, but you know, so that sort of level of access and relationship is what the president um, pays people like me for. Uh, but that is not in place of you know, his own engagement with Mike or Mike's colleagues or a bunch of other people across the spectrum. So two things, so first of all, just a little bit of clarification. The president didn't actually <laughs> say, didn't actually like totally undermine what I wrote. What, I, <laughs> what he said was that it was sort of just more of a joke, which is, which is kind of what I wrote anyway, but a um, <laughs> little sensitive. Um, but I, what I will say is Brandy is being um, uh, way too humble here, um, both about her own, but both about the role that um, people play like her, but also herself. Um, the president obviously is the main communicator t of the big messages and we uh, in the press are always, always, always pushing for more access directly to him and we do have, uh, you know, we, we do have that sometimes and we, and we crave more. Um, but uh, the day-to-day -day, um, operation of politics, of national politics and of Washington happens because, not because the president is, communi is, is, is able to sort of weigh in on every little thing, it requires people like Brandy um, to, um, uh, to be the, um, to have the finesse to be able to bridge what, what, is, what is this kind of weird place where both, where she is, her job is to serve the president of the United States to make sure his message is, um, conveyed, but at the same time, she is working with people like me whose interests are very different, and she's got to try to figure a way to bridge that, because um, the, the only thing that makes this work is the relationships that we're able to have. And, um, you know, Brandy in particular, uh, and, and there, are, there are others that I've worked with at the White House as well, um, have a kind of magical ability to be able to understand what my needs are, um, to be able to seven tell- Seven almonds, right? <laughs> seven. <laughs> To be able to tell me when, when she can't get me something, which is understandable, then I'll push and she'll push back and we'll go back and forth. Um, but, but there is a symbiotic part of this that wouldn't work if we didn't talk to each other. And the whole operation of government would come kind of to a screeching, frozen halt if there weren't people like Brandy who you could go to. And she, in particular, does an amazing job. You talk about these intersections, like you know, you're in the White House, you're in the White House. You have very different jobs. I'm kind of curious, like if we had to think of a day in the life of a White House day, what does your job look like on a daily basis? And Mike, what does your job look like on a daily basis? And describe where the the intersection happens. Yeah. So um, we had a pretty. I gave a pretty detailed readout down to like what time I go to the gym to this table. So if anyone wants like the unabridged <laughs> what time do you go version. To the gym? I try to go between 6 and 6.45. Okay. Wow. Um, because I've learned that, AM, because I've learned that if you put the gym off till PM, then the glass of wine looks mm. so much better than the treadmill. <laughs> so, um, 
you know, I, I sort of, to give the abridged version, I, I, I break my job up into sort of three buckets, and I think the f there's two buckets that heavily overlap with Mike, and then a third that um, eventually overlaps with Mike. The first is prepping the press secretary for the press briefing every day, which is a, a process that starts the night before and goes all the way until um, the briefing is over around 2 p.m. Um, and so that's, we can maybe get into more of that if folks have questions or if, um, if Zach has questions. But um, that's one bucket and that's very labor intensive and it's a lot of work and it requires drawing on what Mike asked me the day before to think about where he's gonna go tomorrow with his story and you know what question he might pose to the press secretary to make sure he's not caught off guard. Um, so that's one bucket. Uh, a second bucket is just all the other questions that Mike has on a given day and all of his colleagues. So sort of dealing with kind of the daily incoming those are often questions about the president's schedule. Is he gonna make news tomorrow in a speech? Um, I've heard this policy announcement is coming. Can you tell me if it's coming and can you tell me more about it? Um, so sort of that general kind of the relationship that Mike spoke to that we have with reporters, I'd say that's sort of bucket number two. And then the third is kind of the one piece of my day that's somewhat proactive, uh, which is thinking ahead to what policy we're gonna roll out the next week. What um, announcement are we gonna make how are we gonna do it? Are we gonna give it as an exclusive to the New York Times or are we just gonna tweet it out? Um, yeah. <laughs> See what I mean? Exactly. Uh, so thinking through sort of how, how can we best communicate the president's message using the tools that are available and doing some of that forward looking planning uh, so that we can make sure we're very put together for the week ahead. So in the briefest, most terms, mm -hmm. I would say that's kind of the three pieces of the job. Yeah, um, and you know, mine has similar divisions, um, um, you know, my, my day is usually divided between short term, longer term, uh, and um, uh, strategic stories, right? And so the, the, the short term stuff is literally, you know, you come in and you, you have no idea uh, that you think you're gonna be working on one thing and then David Petraeus resigns mm. at 4 p.m. on a Friday or whatever. Or Justice Scalia passes away. Or Justice away. Scalia dies when I'm sitting at the poker table on Saturday. <laughs> um, or whatever happens and you, I mean, you know, the great wonderful thing about journalism is you jump, you know, you jump in at that moment. And so there's, there is a lot of, um, there's a lot of that. And in Washington and the White House feed in particular, um, there's a lot of stuff that comes out of the White House that they, you know, Brandy's good and the White House is good about giving us heads up on some things, um, uh, but there's a lot of stuff that they don't give us heads up on and, and for all sorts of reasons and so there's a lot of kind of putting out fires. Um, particular to the New York Times, we have four White House reporters and we have a kind of duty rotation that's on a weekly basis, so um, on any given week, if it's my duty week, uh, then uh, Brandy sees me more often. I'm over at the White House every single day that week. I go to the, br I'm the guy responsible for going to the press secretary's briefing, which um, uh, never, ever starts on time, ever. <laughs> never starts on time. Just wanna keep you on your toes. Um, I know. Um, but, uh, so I go to the briefing. If, if I'm the duty guy that week, I travel wherever the pres president is gonna travel. Um, if I'm the duty guy and something pops up on a random subject, if there's a shooting and we have to follow up with the, the president makes a statement or uh, there's a congressional bill that the president vetoes or whatever, I mean, that's the sort of duty guy's responsibility. If you're not on duty and, and you know, increasingly that spills over into other weeks, but if you're not, you have a little bit more time for us. I mean, the nice thing about having four White House reporters is that I can walk over to Brandy when I'm not on duty and say, hey, I'd like to do a, story, a more in-depth story on, for example, the commutations that the president is, has been sort of spinning out once a month. Um, the president has commuted more sentences than any other, than all the presidents, I think, combined. Past right? 11. Huh? Past 11 presidents combined. The past 11 presidents, okay. Brandy, this is her in her portfolio, so we've. I have a whole graphic, we can talk later. Yeah. Um, seven almonds, 11 seven presidents. Almonds, yeah. Right. Yeah, exactly. And a partridge and a pear tree, it'll be great. Um, <laughs> But those are the kinds of stories, like she and I are, are talking all the time and, and I'm talking to her colleagues who are on other topics or I'm talking to the press secretary or whatever about um, uh, stories that we can work on that are longer term stories. Uh, the, the Times at the, uh, at the moment is, is in the process of doing a whole series of legacy stories uh, on Obama's legacy. Um, uh, and those are stories that take weeks if not months to do and some of it involves 
doesn't involve the White House, involves interviewing elsewhere, but a lot of it involves the White House. The climate change interview that we had was part of that legacy series. Um, and then the third bucket is, this, is the strategic stuff, and that is, um, it can be short term, it can be long term, but it tends to be stuff where <laughs> we're going around these guys, where we're trying to, we're trying to um, pierce the veil of, uh, of, of their kind of defined message, and whether that is figuring out what the president um, and his, what the president's aides are really telling him on Afghanistan strategy or ISIS, or whether it's um, you know, trying to figure out if they have some new economic proposal to make that we haven't heard of before. A lot of reporting uh, you know, kind of around, one of the things you find out about the White House is that, it, that ideas germinate in the White House at a very small, in a very small circle. And the closer they get to fruition, the wider that circle becomes. And they start bringing in interest groups, and they start bringing in members of Congress, and they start bringing in uh, other people that they're trying to kind of flesh out the idea and, and prepare it for, for unveiling. And so that's the moment that we, those are the moments that we are looking for to try to get ahead of uh, kind of their messaging. And we love that. <laughs> <laughs> so I, in, in talking, getting back to this point about the dynamics of change in the media, I, I decided to dig up a few figures to try to uh, give myself some perspective on how the media has changed since I was a student. So uh, Pew does an annual uh, research on the state of the media in the United States. And so I looked up some figures, and I was kind of shocked myself. I mean, when I'm, when I'm looking at my students now, I, I have this feeling that they're not looking at newspapers, but now I have some facts. So. When I graduated in 1999, uh, 18 to 24-year-olds, 42% of them read newspapers on a daily basis. Uh, last year, in 2015, according to Pew, that number has declined to 16%. And in terms of the way in which, so what are they looking at uh, if they're not looking at newspapers? So Pew says that 61% of millennials get their news from Facebook, whereas 60% of baby boomers get their political news from local television. Mm. <laughs> and you look great on TV. Yeah, right. And I, I won't even get into the figures about you know how circulation and revenue continues to decline year after year for newspapers. So I'm not picking on you, Mike, but yeah. I, I, I just want to get some perspective since you've worked in print journalism for such a long time about you know how sick is the newspaper industry? Do you guys have the resources to do your job? And where do you see your industry going in the next ten years? Okay, so. To subscribe, it's 1-800. <laughs> <laughs> um, no, I, it's terrible. It yeah. is terrible. It is, it is probably worse than that even describes. And um, the uh, you know, mid-size papers across the country have died first, and there's very few good mid-size papers anymore. Um, the big newspapers are struggling um, terribly. Uh, you know, many of you who are actually students here won't even remember times when classified sections in newspapers were, were literally this thick. Thou millions of dollars in revenue that just evaporated overnight with eBay and with Craigslist. Um, it's, uh, to, to put it in perspective, that Africa trip that I, uh, you know, that I talked about, the one where we went to Tanzania and then we actually went to Cape Town and then, uh, Senegal, Cape Town and Tanzania, um, <laughs> To send one reporter to send me on that trip was almost ninety thousand dollars wow. for one week with the president, um, and that doesn't begin to talk about uh, what it costs to cover war uh, in Afghanistan, Iraq, what it costs to cover a campaign. I mean, it is a it, you know it is uh, hundreds of millions of dollars operation to try to for just one news organization to try to cover this stuff, and there are just few news organizations that can do that anymore, and. The, 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 the simple fact is that when you read that statistic, and then I'll shut up, that when you read that no, stati no, statistic about the 61% on Facebook, get mm -hmm. their news from Facebook, uh, that, that's us. I mean, that, that news that you're getting is via Facebook, but it's, it's, it's news that is almost exclusively produced by a handful of news organizations that have the resources still to produce it and to spend the time with the White House, with the policy people, with Congress, out in the field, in the war, covering the wars, doing the investigations. And 
um, and yet we're not getting the revenue when you know when you uh, when you click on that. And so um, you know. There's a lot of different experimentation that's going on. The New York Times, where I work, is uh, trying desperately to, to pursue a subscriber, a paid digital subscriber model, where we get, uh, I think we have $400, $400 million worth of revenue from digital subscriptions and, and ads, and we are, the goal over the next 10 years or something is to double that to 800 million. Even that wouldn't begin to sort of solve our problem 100%, but that's our model. Washington Post is taking a totally different approach by uh, trying to I vastly increase the number of clicks that it gets and then sell ads against that. Um, that it's, new, its new owner might have something with that and strategy. And <laughs> that then the owner is Jeff Bezos, who runs Amazon.com, um, so, he, so he's doing that. So there, we're trying different things, but um, it's, it's a struggle, and I think ultimately we have to, I mean, both Brandy and I, since we went to CMC, like have this idea that media and uh, and the intersection of media and and, uh, and government is important. It's, it's it's not you know I mean yes the New York Times is trying to make a profit but like this is important for democracy and if we lose that if we lose the ability for for um, for us to try to hold the government uh, accountable uh, I think we're going to be in trouble. Brandy, do you have a perspective on this? Uh, I guess I, probably two things. One, I would say. There's not a day that I've been on this job, and I've been on it for a little more than two years now, or a day that I've been working in press where I don't think about what the New York Times is reporting that day. That's good. So, um, <laughs> you know, look, they have a lot of um, challenges, but I think that um, they continue to be a organization that is able to invest the kind of resources and the kind of serious coverage um, that, uh, you know, has people like me investing those resources. I think what it just means is that people who do press just sleep a lot less because we have to worry about what the New York Times is reporting, but we also have to worry about a myriad of other channels that are reporting the news. And so one thing that we've tried to do at the White House is, uh, like I said, a both and strategy. And I think a really good example of that is um, earlier this year, the president traveled to Cuba um, for a historic trip after um, you know, we lifted the embargo on Cuba. And uh, while we were there, the president did an interview with David Muir of ABC News, Nightly News, another sort of mainstay and mm -hmm. kind of, um, you know, mm -hmm. the you know, mainstream journalism apparatus. He did a very good conversation with him. We invested a lot of resources into that. We also did a conversation with ESPN while the president was at a baseball game in Cuba. Um, and that was kind of the other side of it, which is uh, we want to reach the people that watch ABC News. We also want to reach the people that watch ESPN. And the president had a great conversation about baseball and the tradition and the game that we were hosting, but he also talked a little bit of you know administration policy about uh, the changes that were being made to the U.S.-Cuba relationship and the historic nature of that. So I think what we have to try to do is sort of just not be specialists, but be very diversified in the way that we're sort of using all of the tools at our disposal. You two seem to get on really well, despite the fact like that Mike. you have an adversarial relationship, right? I mean, essentially. It's true. <laughs> You know, it's we're dog and cats here, right? And you've talked a little bit about how, you know, your interests don't always align. So, mm -hmm. I, I'm just curious to hear, like, let's take a press briefing for example. You know, you you have a very different goal than you do at a press briefing. And so I'm kind of curious, how do you guys prepare for that? What are your particular goals as you prepare? Um, and how do, are there any strains on on your friendship there? <laughs> No, on the no. latter. I no. mean, look, I don't think you can work in professional politics and, and take uh, a single interaction with a reporter very personally. Right. So Mike and I have had contentious discussions over stories he's written, um, but the fact of the matter is I'm going to see Mike in my tiny little hole in my eight-person <laughs> office the next day. So you want to make sure that at least even if you can't come to a resolution on that particular matter that you maintain the relationship because he'll be back again and we'll work together again and we may not see eye to eye on the next thing either, but you, I think, need to take the long view sort of in these relationships. Um, in terms of the press briefing, I don't know that our goals are always so different. I think sometimes they are, but I think the way we approach it is uh, we need to communicate the president's proactive policy agenda. And sometimes reporters are genuinely asking questions because they don't understand uh, the thinking of the administration or the thinking of the president. And so in that regard, I think, our interests are aligned. We want to give you insight into the thinking of the president. Mike wants to gain insight into the thinking of the president. Now, there are other times where he's testing our propositions and our thinking and pushing us to try to 
um, you know, explain uh, criticism that we've received on a particular issue. That's probably where um, our interests diverge a little bit more. But we undertake a process that begins the day before. It's sort of a, you intake all the questions you've gotten from all the reporters, you intake all the news you've read, you intake sort of all the um, policy announcements you've made, and you try to separate the signal from the noise and think about what is the briefing room really gonna be focused on tomorrow. And um, you know, sometimes it's really trivial stuff, and sometimes it's really heavy and serious stuff, and it sort of just depends on the day and what else is going on in politics, and so you sort of have to prepare for both. If we only prepared for serious questions, then that would be the day we get the subonomics question or something like that. So you sort of have to make sure that you're covering all of your bases. And so folks who have my job will take all that information in, we'll make some strategic choices about what we think reporters like Mike are gonna ask, we'll prepare written guidance that's Q&A style format that we put into this book that the press secretary takes up to the briefing. Now, Josh Ernest, our press secretary, is incredibly good at his job, and there are days where he doesn't even crack that book open because he knows the substance so well. But it's there as a resource if um, you know a question that he's less well-versed in comes up. So we'll write that written guidance and we'll go into his office and we'll do sort of murder board mock Q&A with him, you know, being our most annoying version of Mike to try to get under his skin <laughs> hard. and like, you know, ruffle his feathers and, you know, try to think about what the questions, exactly how they'll come to him are and we'll practice that. And after about 45 minutes or so, he'll do the same thing with a different team of people who cover more foreign policy issues than um, my team does. And after that, we send him out, feed him to the wolves. Um, and let Mike and his uh, colleagues fire away. There's 49 seats in the press briefing room. Sometimes I think on TV it looks like we're like shouting and it's really far away, but the front row of the press briefing room is even closer than you and I are to each other right now. So it's actually a pretty intimate environment that um, you know, mm -hmm. lends itself at least to some extent to discussion. Yeah, I mean, I, and I think from our perspective, so they have this broad, you know, they're, they're having to kind of imagine the the, what the, the entire possibilities might be. And typically for us, our goal is kind of more narrow, right? Like we, um, uh, you know, we, when I go at attend the briefing, you sort of go on the one hand proact protectively because you never know what, maybe Josh comes out and announces some new policy or, set or makes a comment that is different than kind of where the administration has been before. But generally speaking, I've got one or two or three things that I want out of that briefing I, I, that I want to get Josh to answer for. Um, usually that coincides with the stories that I know the paper is working on. So if I know the, uh, you know, one of the, my colleagues on the foreign staff is working on a Syria story, uh, maybe there's something I want to try to press Josh on on Syria. If I know that uh, Congress is about to kill the, uh, uh, you know, gun control bill, you know, I wanna make sure that Josh addresses and reacts to something that Congress has done. Um, the craziness about the briefing tends to be the fact that um, none of the reporters in the briefing room are coordinating with each other. We're all competitors. So, you know, the New York Times is sitting next to the Washington Post and the whole front row is all the networks. And so th there's a sort of kind of insanity to the whole thing because I may ask a question on Syria and then two seconds later the next guy asks the same question <laughs> on Syria and then the same question gets asked a third time and sometimes they're kind of mm, asked a slightly different way but in the end it sort of has this feeling of um, uh, what are you people doing? Like <laughs> why do you keep asking the same question? He's just gonna give you the same answer that's written on page 37 of his book. Um, <laughs> And um, so th often they are a frustrating kind of, uh, my grandmother was very pissed after about six months when uh, in, the, uh, in the first months of the administration, they, uh, the, the CNN and everybody would broadcast the briefing live, the whole briefing, this was when Gibbs was Incredible. press secretary. Yeah. And then all of a sudden, my 106 year old grandma, the, they'd stopped broadcasting live and she said, where are you? I can't see you every day anymore. Because <laughs> she would see me in the back of my head. <laughs> um, but it's really, it's an awful thing to watch. I mean, it's really, I would like <laughs> recommend it to nobody. It, it's like, it's just, don't you think? I mean, seeing Jake Tapper ask the same question five times, I mean, really? There, there are days that you guys endear yourselves to us more right. than others, but I mean, you know. <laughs> and I do think, we're, and I do think we don't, we're not always on our best behavior and we sometimes mm -hmm. are um, obnoxious and, uh, uh, I mean, so it's true. Um, but I think, but I think, 
the, the most important times in the briefing room are those serious moments, right? Those serious moments when something has happened. Uh, you know, I remember being in the briefing room after Newtown uh, and the shootings at Newtown. I remember being in the briefing room um, at key moments um, when, um, you know, the stray bombs have killed people in Syria or Iraq or, you know, I mean, there are those moments when you feel like the spotlight of the world is on that podium and on the people that are in that room and the, the, the press secretary is really answering for the entire administration, for the president on some serious topic. And those are the moments that you sort of catch your breath and you realize, wow, this is really an, a kind of an important moment. And, and, and I feel like both sides rise to that occasion. I mean, you know, in, in, you know, there's sniping and kind of funniness elsewhere, but when on those like big moments, those tend to be times, uh, you know, oftentimes the White House press secretary will, you know, not be able to give the full answer that the press corps wants, and we just keep pressing and pressing and pressing to try to get it. Um, uh, but but the, the one other thing I wanted to say about the relationship, um, we are at, we, Brandy is right, we've had our fights. She's criticized my stories. I've, you know, pushed back against, you know, a, on access that I didn't think, information I didn't think we got that we should have gotten. Um, but a lot of it is the a lot of it is the people too, and um, and you know to be perfectly honest, there are people in this business, on the press on the press side and on the and on the politics side, that are just jerks. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you know, I mean I think it's true, and and I mean part of it is just who whether you know finding those people that you can trust and that you can work with. Um, I, I I think I've told have I told the hurricane story. I've heard that one. So, <laughs> so uh, Robert Gibbs was the first press secretary for the administration. And he and I had a very contentious relationship. I think if he were here, I think he would say we, I think he would agree with that, but also say we ended up in a f an okay place. But my favorite moment uh, uh, of tension over that was early on in the administration, the president went to New Orleans for the first time as president. He'd been there as a candidate, but he had never been to New Orleans as president. It was early, maybe, maybe early fall in 2009. And the idea was to go and to sort of communicate that, uh, that this administration was gonna help New Orleans rebuild in a way that the Bush administration <coughs> had just, you know, people were frustrated. If you lived in New Orleans, you thought that there was all this bureaucratic red tape and you weren't getting, you weren't recovering quickly enough from Hurricane Katrina. And the President Obama was gonna go down there and say this, I'm doing way better. And I did a story, I was at the Washington Post at the time, I did a story, uh, that appeared the morning that he flew down there. I had interviewed all sorts of people in New Orleans and I had quoted a bunch of people, almost all of whom said that this president was no better than Bush. Um, and in various different ways said that they were still frustrated and there was too much red tape and there was, um, and that this president basically wasn't any better than George W. Bush. And so the story appears and I fly down on the charter plane and we get there and I land and I take out my I don't know if I still have a Blackberry or an iPhone at that point. And um, I see a message, and there's a message from Gibbs, and it simply says, I still have it, it simply says, if you think Hurricane Katrina was bad, wait till Hurricane Gibbs races up your ass. <laughs> <laughs> and lots of people have lots of different styles in this job, so. Um, and, so I, I didn't see Gibbs that, uh, he like, we, he kept his distance, I think, and he was so mad. And the next day at the White House, uh, they don't do this very, uh, Josh doesn't do this very much, but Gibbs used to do these, what they called gaggles in the morning, where he'd have like 20 or 25 reporters that would come to his office, which is an upper press, which is a kind of, kind of up a hallway from where Brandy sits. And so we had this gaggle, and it's sort of to, to give you the sense of what's going to happen at the White House that day. And we have this gaggle, and it ends. It takes about 25 minutes, and everybody's kind of leaving Gibbs's office. And I hear, "Sheer, you stay." <laughs> <laughs> and everybody leaves, and I'm standing there with Gibbs in his office, and he shuts the door, and he starts screaming mm -hmm. at me. I mean, just like you know, the poking of the finger in the chest, and screaming that I should have that that was an unfair story and I should have found people who, there were lots of people I could have quoted who, you know, would have said positive things about what the president was doing, et cetera, et cetera. 
And in retrospect, I think that he was mad. I mean, it was clearly like he, that, and as Brandy says, that was his style. That was, that was his, the way he kind of approached things. But it was also strategic in a sense for him because, you know, as a human being, you, like, you just never, you, you want to avoid, if you can, being yelled at like that. <laughs> <laughs> and so I think there was a part of him who sort of, that his theory of the case was, you know, if I make it as uncomfortable for sheer as I can, then the next time that he's writing a story, he's going he's gonna to spend that extra 15 minutes to place another call and get a, you know, a quote that's a, maybe a more, make it a more balanced story. And in fact, I actually don't, I mean, I, I went back at one point and I read that story, and he was right. I mean, I think he was right. I don't know that he was as right that required all that yelling, <laughs> but, but he was right. Like it, I'm sure that I could have found, had I spent a little bit more time, I could have made it you know, maybe an extra quote or two that made it a little bit more balanced. And so, you know, I think he knew that. And I think he understands that, like, we're all human beings. We all crave, like, a good relationship, and we don't want to be yelled at at 5 in the morning and, you know, or whatever. And so, but, th but that's what I mean. Like, there are people who kind of, I've never had anywhere near that kind of experience with Brandy. So, like, it's just. My mom's here, so if you did, let's not. Uh, yeah, no, yeah. it's <laughs> not. Well, well sp speaking of intemperance here. Yeah, that's mom, so cool. wave. Oh, there she is. Oh, hi. <laughs> nice to meet you. Well, so speaking of intemperance and vulgarity, oh, we should give. Can we give I'm them? Just, some I'm chat? getting okay. there. I was just going to say, my these life. people to ask questions. <laughs> speaking of intemperance and vulgarities, I know that we would like to talk about the presidential election. Um, and I, I, <laughs> that was a great. Did that you was see a really that? good segue. That see? was excellent. That's, but I know you've worked in campaigns before. Yes. But I'm sure our audience is buzzing with questions, particularly about the debates, about how this campaign is being conducted, how this is different from your experience. So. I think it's probably a good time at this point to open it up to audience questions, to find out nice. more about elections, find out more about their jobs, or just generally speaking about working in DC. So who's got a question? Yeah. Question. If you'd like to ask a question, please raise your hand, and Sarah or I will come to you. And Brandy's mom, you know. Yeah, no questions, mom. No questions. Oh, good. That's great. Hi. Thank you so much for your talk. Um, we've seen in this election both Donald Trump and Hillary Clinton have taken very different and very unique stances to their, um, their interactions with the press. Donald Trump has been banning organizations from covering him if he doesn't like what they say. And Hillary Clinton hasn't really had many uh, press conferences at all at all and hasn't really been talking to the press much directly. So how do you see, depending on who wins in November, um, that impacting how uh, White House coverage changes with the new president. Do you want think, no, I think you that, should take that's that one. me. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'm terrified. I, I actually, I, I think um, so. A couple things. There are um, there the rules that govern kind of the press, White House presidential press interactions are essentially based on tradition. There, there's nothing, there's no laws to this. There's no, there's nothing other than a set of um, traditions of ways that it's happened over the last five, six decades. And, you know, we, we sort of informally date it to, to Kennedy's assassination. I mean, there was a real, most of the press corps didn't bother to go to Texas with Kennedy, and then they felt really stupid that they weren't with him at that point. And so that sort of changed. Um, kind of the way in which the press, the press tries to stay with the president at all times. Um, and, you know, no matter what party the president has been uh, since then, there's been a kind of understanding of a set of um, things that you just do if you're the president of the United States. And part of that is that you allow a small group of reporters called the pool. There's 13 reporters. They are a mix of a couple of print reporters, some wire reporters, a several photographers and a TV crew, and they travel with the president everywhere he goes. Um, and by everywhere, I mean just about everywhere. If he, you know, there was, a, there was a period of time where the president decided a few years ago that he wanted to, like, leave the White House grounds and go get, like, a burger across <laughs> Lafayette Square, and we all started calling it the bear is loose. That was <laughs> our little thing, the bear is loose. Um, but, like, 
if he went across the street to get a burger, so did the 13 reporters. They follow um, him to the gym They literally the follow they, him to the gym. Yeah. They follow him. I mean, we go everywhere he goes. Which is why the president often says one of the things he's most looking forward to when he gets out of the White House is a long walk by himself. Yeah. So. Um, and, uh, and presidents, there is a whole infrastructure that's built up to accommodate, uh, to accommodate that understanding. Um, and, and press conferences are another example of something that presidents have submitted themselves to for decades and on a regular basis, um, you know, some more, some less, but they've all understood that that's part of the responsibility of being president. Um, and there's a whole list of things. And, and honestly, I, the, um, both campaigns have been, uh, typically what happens is that, that kind of, those kinds of processes get started in the last few months of a campaign, you know, that whether you're the Democratic nominee or the Republican nominee, you, you submit yourself to a pool of traveling reporters. Uh, you, it's called a protective pool is the, is the name of it. Um, you have press conferences, you do these things. Both campaigns have been completely resistant to these traditions. Um, uh, neither Trump nor Clinton um, have fully allowed a protective pool. They still don't. The uh, best example of that was uh, when Hillary fainted at the 9-11 uh, um, memorial. memorial service, um, there, w there had not been a protective pool that, t that picked her up at her house in Chappaqua, which would normally have been the case. Um, so there was no press in the motorcade with her from her house to the event. There was some press at the event. Um, when she fainted, they put her in the motorcade. They drove her off. There was no press in that motorcade. She could have gone anywhere. Turned out she went to Chelsea's apartment. We didn't know. We weren't there. Um, it's, uh, it's the first time a major party candidate has done that um, and has been unwilling to submit in decades, um, other than Donald Trump, who also doesn't have a protective <laughs> pool and is even more uh, kind of dismissive of the press and uh, of the tradition. So um, I, am, I am very concerned that uh, you know, I guess I sort of think that if Clinton is elected, um, that the norms at the White House will will kind of push her in that direction, and she'll have a protective pool ultimately, and she will do some press conferences. Um, uh, who knows with Trump? I mean, I really, I, and that's not a partisan statement, but I mean, I really, I really have no idea whether. He's going to get in the motorcade, and they're going to say, "Mr. President, you have to wait for the press." And he's going to say, "No, I don't," and just drive off. You know, I mean, I just have no idea. Um, and um, uh, you know, I, I think all we can do is wait and see. Uh, the reporters at the White House are organized by a group called the White House Correspondents Association, uh, which is, you know, just like a, a voluntary, you know, mostly voluntary organization that. Um, you know, that is run by the sort of senior White House correspondents and that tries to advocate for more access on, uh, to the president and for, for all of these kind of traditional rules of uh, engagement. And I think, uh, and, I, and we are all um, anxious about that, <coughs> that transition and trying to make sure that, that some of these traditions stay in place. And I think Mike summed it up well. I can't speak to sort of the internal thinking on either of the two campaigns, but I can tell you that, at least in our administration, like I said, we'll never give Mike the full access that he's looking for, but we have tried to um, routinize some pieces of the type of access that we yeah. give. So um, the president, when he does a fundraiser, his remarks are open to the pool that travels with him. Now, they would love it if the remarks plus the Q&A were open to the pool that travels with them, and they frequently um, make requests to that effect, but that's something that we've done that we've sort of formalized as a matter of policy in our right. administration. And you know, that's sort of how these transparency traditions get built, is one administration does it as a regular practice, and then you know, people like Mike hope that the next administration builds on that. And, the other thing we've done is we release um, all the records of everybody who comes in the White House doors. So anyone who gets cleared by the Secret Service to come in the White House, there's five million of these clearance records. We put them online so people like Mike can comb through them and see how many times a certain CEO was at the White House, or see how many times a certain right. Hollywood celebrity came to the White House, or ask us questions about why an individual was meeting with so-and-so. And that's something that the previous administration actually went to court to block the release of. And we have chosen to proactively make those records available. So it will never be the perfect amount of access, but I do think these traditions get built by presidents who care about transparency, thinking about ways that we can augment uh, the, 
the transparency that we're building on. And, and I think they just they do deserve credit. I don't think the transparency is perfect. The list, the visitors list, isn't a hundred percent of the people that come in. And very true. The small percentage of them that are not are often the most interesting ones. <laughs> but a but lot that, of your but, colleagues but have written no, many I, stories I off no, of that I, list. I agree. So. I, agree. Um, I will say. Uh, that and so so but I do give them credit they have done things to institutionalize some of this and I think that's good um, there's been one piece that has eroded um, I under this president especially I think it started under Bush but it's fully gone almost under this president um, and that is um, in and, and I can't testify to this directly but my colleagues who've covered pre previous presidencies um, the president used to um, allow uh, what they called little um, called gaggles. The gaggles, little yeah. gaggles with the president where, I mean, you, you, you guys are too young, but like this, this guy, um, Sam Donaldson for ABC News used to make this famous where every single day there would be one or two or three times during the course of a day that the press would get close enough to the president, the president would stop and say, hey, how you doing? And, the, and Sam Donaldson would yell a question or two, or three, you know, there'd be maybe, it wouldn't be long, it would take maybe five minutes, but it was an opportunity through the course of the day <coughs> for uh, the press to just get whatever the news of, usually it was the news of the day, you know, something happened in Iran and you wanted to know, and so you maybe you had the press secretary saying whatever the official line was, but this was an opportunity to get the president himself commenting on what happened that day, and, um, uh, you know, I, you can't claim that it was super substantive because it was always just little snippets, mm -hmm. but it was, but it, but it was something. You know, you 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 could count on throughout the course of the week having the president. The TV people loved it because they they needed, you know, the visual of the president actually saying something. Um, Obama has virtually done away with that. I mean, it 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 every now and then if he's in the Oval Office and there's a world leader, he'll bring the press in and, and he'll say something, but only if he really wants to say something, and more often than not, they don't allow any questions, or if there's a question that's shouted, uh, the president ignores it. And so, um, I, I feel like that now is dead. Like, I feel like after the Obama administration, uh, there's no president that's gonna submit him or herself to a sort of regular, everyday uh, kind of interaction with the press, because again, we go back to the control issue, it's, it's a much less, formal process and the president, you know, I'm sure President Reagan probably got into trouble answering Sam Donaldson's questions and so, and, and obviously this president in particular doesn't view that as a sort of helpful, especially since, you know, Obama can't answer a question in under like 42 minutes Well, that anyway. was what I was going to say is if we did <laughs> so, this, like all he would do is stand on the driveway and answer this one question all day right. long because he's not a president who speaks not, in sound bites. Right, so maybe... But I, but I sort of feel like that's kind of dead now. It's interesting. I think like diversity of the media, you know, the Sam Donaldson era was a much smaller press that's corps, true. I think. So that's I true. think, you know, you're talking about if you're going to be equitable, accommodating a lot more people than maybe you were accommodating in that particular era. I think the president does do it from time to time, though I take your point that it's not an everyday occurrence. I also think, and in their defense, I also think that, you know, even in the Sam Donaldson era, even though that was television, the President Reagan could know that he would, he would, whatever he would say would come back into the control rooms or come back into the newsrooms, and it would be hours, you know, the sort of, it would, it would, the, that quote from the President would be part of the news gathering process that would, at the end of the day, end up in a broadcast for the nightly news or end up in a news story for the next day. Now what they have to deal right. with is Twitter, and the instant mm -hmm. the president says it, it'll be tweeted out two seconds later. Mm -hmm. And I do think that they are right to think that that's a different dynamic and that the old dynamic doesn't really exist anymore. The dynamic of sort of news organizations taking that comment back and sort of, you know, giving it some context and putting some thought into how to report it. But it's a question, I mean, we constantly wrestle with, and the president doesn't speak in sound bites, and um, you know, there are different constraints on his time and the media is comprised differently and you know, what you guys care about at 2 p.m. on a certain day is different than what you care about at 2.15 p.m. on a certain <laughs> day oftentimes. It's so there's a lot of sort of competing factors. The only thing I will say, and this will actually be a proof to Mike's point, not to the contrary, is the times where I've learned the most from this president in a media setting are often the longer form interviews he does. So he's a very sort of, um, you know, he likes to engage in the exchange of ideas. He likes to mull things over. He likes to get into a conversation and sort of roll up his sleeves and dig in. And so the conversation that the president had not too far from here in a Los Angeles garage with Mark Marin, 
uh, for his podcast was one of the most insightful conversations I've heard the president have on race, uh, period, end of story. And so I think you, know, you also have to think about the president that you're serving and the way in which they communicate and the way they sort of convey their ideas. And this president is um, long-winded. I was going to say, uh, oh, well, yeah. <laughs> this president has a lot to say often. Um, and I think when you really let him stretch his legs and sort of get into the conversation, it can be incredibly revealing. Um, and I think you know, people like Mike have drawn a lot on these longer form conversations for story ideas and things they want to follow up on, um, you know, places they want to go in their reporting. Uh, and I think that that's actually been a benefit to you guys, yeah, too. Totally true. Another question? Unfortunately, we only have time for one more question. Uh -oh. Um, thank you for coming. Um, back to Professor Corser's statistics about most people getting their news from Facebook. Um, definitely something that I and my peers see a lot. Um, what do you think about um, organizations like um, like Now This or AJ Plus or even things like um, The Daily Show, um, um, John Oliver? And also, what do you think about um, the internet and virality giving rise to sort of niche news organizations um, that are on the extremes of the political spectrum? I think that's a great question. Um, I heard this and then I had to go look it up to make sure it was true because it surprised me, but this president is the first sitting president to appear on a late night television show. Presidents have appeared as candidates on these shows, but no other pres sitting president has appeared on a late night comedy show. So I think it's incredibly powerful that we have a president who can give um, you know, long sweeping speeches on foreign policy, but he can go on Jimmy Fallon and he can slow jam the news. And maybe he'll sneak in a mention about his trade deal while he's there. Um, so I think that that's a tool that he has in his toolbox that's been effective um, for us to use to communicate his policy agenda. In the vein of now this and other sort of news organizations, something else that I found to be really interesting was um, the president in uh, 2014 did uh, Between Two Ferns with Zach Galifianakis. It's an incredible piece Hysterical. of comedy. It's very, very funny. It got some award. Uh, it got an, uh, an Emmy, uh, an or, Emmy. An Emmy yeah. or something, right? Um, Incredible piece of comedy, very funny, um, but it was to plug that young people should uh, go to the ACA website and look and see if they, uh, if the Affordable Care Act was for them, if they could get good health care coverage through the Affordable Care Act. Was that before or after the website worked? It was after. Okay. <laughs> you know, because we want people to actually be able to take advantage. Uh -huh. Uh -huh. So uh, very funny skit, but ostensibly the purpose was to communicate a pretty serious public policy goal of ours. Uh, that was the single biggest driver of traffic to the ACA website of anything we did, any interview we did, any um, you know, Facebook posts the president did, anything uh, during that particular enrollment period. So these are really powerful tools to reach certain audiences, and in this case, an audience that we, you know, younger people, that we really wanted to consider uh, whether the Affordable Care Act would be an appropriate health care option for them. Uh, it got, it had, I looked last night, it had 39 million views. Uh, so I think that those types of websites can be really powerful tools, not just sort of for having fun and late night comedy shows, not just sort of for having fun and showing the lighter side of a president, which people don't always get to see, but also for advancing you know, very serious policy um, agenda items. And I know we don't have much time, but I'll just say, um, I think that those um, kind of other kinds of outlets are great. I think John Oliver is like brilliant, I thought. Um, uh, uh, John Stewart was spectacular. I mean, I th I, they're done well and at their best. They're really substantive and smart. And I think that as part of an overall diet of news, like go go for it, right? I mean, but I do think that that there's two dangers. Um, one is that if all you rely on is the kind of humor sites and the kind of late night shows, et cetera. I do think there's a danger of uh, getting a kind of warped perspective on what's going on in the world, both in terms of what they choose to talk about and how they choose to talk about it. And I think to your, to kind of the latter part of your question, that sort of niche, uh, I think what the internet has done is given rise to, a, a, uh, to a, the ability never before seen to be able to feed your consumption of news only with stuff that you already agree with if you want to. Um, the customization, the ability to kind of filter out uh, anything you disagree with um, <coughs> by, by 
you know, picking and choosing the narrow stuff that you already believe um, is really a kind of dangerous thing for our, for our kind of body politic. And um, that's not to say that we haven't always had um, opinion stuff in, in the kind of news uh, sphere, and we have, and there's been yellow journalism, and there's been times that there's been less objective journalism and more objective, and it's all gone back and forth, and all of that's fine. Um, but I think, you know, there are, there are moments when I'll, when I'll see something on the O'Reilly show, um, and he is a kind of a master at taking something that happened and twisting it and morphing it into a kind of argument that he wants to make. And then I'll look at what Rachel Maddow did on MSNBC about the same event, and she does it in her perspective. And I'm thinking, I was there, and neither of those have any basis in reality. You know, nothing like what actually happened. And I, and I worry about what happens to our country if we lose sight of uh, kind of the, what actually happened and are only thinking about a kind of uh, version of what happened that conforms to what we already believe anyway. So. For what it's worth, I agree with Mike that it's um, really hard to get your message out when you're all arguing over the same set of facts, but when people are arguing over two very different sets of facts, it creates a, Even worse. a messaging challenge that, um, yeah. that we've grappled with throughout this, this administration and I think the next administration will grapple with too. Indeed. So, uh, we, look, would love to talk to you guys for another 30 minutes or an yeah. hour, but we only have so much time at the app. But I understand that, uh, speaking of alternative media, that you guys did a podcast today. We did, it was we did. great. Would you like to plug that in case people oh. don't listen? Yes. yes. Uh, well, it was, it's the- Free it's Food for Thought. Kate, Kate, Free Food for Thought podcast. We did them separately, but are they gonna be like packaged together or is it? There you go. And how, pe how would people access that? So you guys are plugged into the digital go. media spectrum as it is. Absolutely. So if you guys want to hear more, from, oh, it would also be on the app website. And so, so you can vote for mine. No, no, there's no, <laughs> there's no voting. There's no voting. So if you want to hear more, please take a listen to those podcasts. And join me in thanking both Mike and Brandy for this really excellent conversation. Thank you.